Do you remember the feeling of your first roller coaster? The slow, urgency-filled groan to start, the building anticipation, impatience, that first slow rise, the fall. Some small song in the lowest part of your abdomen floating, weightless for a moment. It's return to equilibrium as the machine screams round your ears. Maybe that song is our very soul, rising up in joy and fear and adulation of the whipping wind. What if life was that roller coaster? Imagine it for a moment. What part of the ride are you on right this very moment? How much longer until the cart slides to its easy stop, rising, and shuffle off into the sunshine to some new adventure? Oftentimes, when I look at pictures of my children as babies, it makes me melancholy, thoughtful, reflective. In 1997, I turned 11 years old. Many things changed that year. School became more harsh and more sharp. One day, I shared with my mother a list of my classmates ranked by, what, popularity, value? I don't know. I only know I was at the bottom of the list, and it made her cry. I started to notice the curves and flats of my body. I started to compare those with the curves and flats of others' bodies. I started to wonder why my body didn't look like other bodies. For Christmas, my parents bought me a PlayStation and Final Fantasy VII. My original PlayStation was destroyed in a flood that filled the basement of my first apartment. It was covered in stickers. One was of Britney Spears, another of Christina Aguilera. In a fit of nostalgialessness, I threw it out. I wish I hadn't, even though it was just a useless bunch of plastic. Just a thing without life, no soul to speak of. My daughters were six and three when my brother passed away. They hardly remember him now. The roller coaster is speeding up. The track is giving speed and the cart by God is taking it. We fly. We do fly. Final Fantasy VII was released in 1997 to an as yet unheard of level of fanfare. FF7 is arguably the most important game in a widely adored series, introducing both longtime and new fans to a cinematic experience that was genuinely novel in video games. Squaresoft, Final Fantasy's developer, had made the shocking decision to jump the ship on Nintendo and join Sony in their much ballyhooed emergence onto the video game market. Here was a company joining the gaming fray that was not a game maker. Unlike Atari, Sega, and Nintendo, Sony was a company already established in the electronics space, prefacing the future entry of Microsoft into that same marketplace. Sony's PlayStation represented, in my opinion, a significant shift in the market appeal of video games. Apparently Square recognized this because they backed the PlayStation full bore. An incredible array of Square's most beloved titles were released on that console, including some truly weird, experimental, and complicated games. In the fall of 1997, as the leaves on the trees turned and my sleepy New England town entered its yearly phase of fiery color, I asked my parents for the most extravagant Christmas present of my childhood. I asked them to buy me a PlayStation and a copy of Final Fantasy VII. I'd been a Nintendo kid for the entirety of my young gaming life, but when I started to see commercials for Final Fantasy VII, when I started to see images of Cloud Strife standing astride a motorcycle, or Barrett Wallace and his ludicrous arm-grafted Gatling gun, and started to read rumors of The Twist and its internet rumor-driven potential undoing, I knew that I must follow Square's lead. Final Fantasy IV and VI, and to a lesser extent games like Chrono Trigger and Secret of Mana, were more important to me than the Nintendo itself. I guess I wasn't ever really a Nintendo baby. I guess that I was more of a Squaresoft baby. Anyway, the importance of those games to me is a tale for another day. Right now, I want to talk about Final Fantasy VII and the absolute nerve I spent weeks wallowing in before I could go to my parents with that ludicrous request. I knew very well, even at 11 years old, that my parents could not really afford to buy something so expensive for Christmas. But I remembered the beautiful new bike I'd received the year before, and the way my father had tied string to the bottom of an empty box, winding that string through the entire house and out a window and into the garage, where it tied in a pretty bow around the tire. I remembered the now infamous story of my mother sneaking into the back room of a Toys R Us to snag a Power Rangers figure, the Tickle Me Elmo gift of the elder millennial generation. I remember how she was caught by some pimply teen and how he had winked and waved her out with the Black Ranger figure under her arm. Just to be clear, she did pay for it. She was grabbing it from the back room because they were sold out of them in the store display. I knew damn well that Christmas was my parents' one chance each year to absolutely spoil us, to do something extravagant, to flaunt their hard work in this little way. I took my shot. I asked for the PlayStation. Final Fantasy VII was a blockbuster hit. 
The PlayStation version alone peaked over 10 million sales in its release year. It featured a full-blown multimedia marketing campaign, had minutes-long FMVs like nothing I'd ever seen in a video game. It was also a significant departure from the fantasy, steampunk adventures of the previous games in the series. This was some sort of sci-fi, cyberpunk-adjacent nonsense with big Akira Toriyama haircuts and, I'll say it again, a man with a Gatling gun grafted prosthetic arm. Historical preservation is simultaneously an academic field and an intentional act, a form of doing and making. Practitioners of the field work towards the goal of, well, preserving history, usually the physical elements of history, buildings, neighborhoods, landscapes, monuments, books, artifacts, you name it. In more recent years, this definition has expanded into the ephemeralities of the virtual world. For instance, the code and art that make up a video game. The act of historical preservation itself is one that can be multifacetedly motivated. Preserving, for instance, a building can be a reflection of many types of values. We might preserve a building for its aesthetic qualities, or its ability to tell a certain story about history, or to increase its monetary value, or as an act of intentional placemaking, as a monument to a particular history at the expense of other histories. Historical preservation is in fact often a zero-sum game. In order to preserve one type of thing about the past, we must sacrifice other things. We must also sacrifice the potential future things that might have existed in the physical and psychological space where that thing will continue to be. Let's lay out what is and isn't preservation. Anytime we preserve anything, that is to say we make the conscious decision not to destroy something or let it fade away as it might without intervention, we're preserving it. In this essay, I'm going to discuss historical battlegrounds, 17th century colonial houses, dioramas at the Museum of Natural History, Main Street USA and Disney World, and the Final Fantasy VII Remake, and make an argument to you that all of these are a form of historical preservation. They have different goals, different mediums, they tell different stories, but they are all preservation. The tremendous success of Final Fantasy VII has had a peculiar effect upon our collective memory of it. The game was a relatively early release in the three-dimensional era, and the first in Square's mainline Final Fantasy series. The game itself was a sort of hodgepodge mishmash of artistic styles and expressions. It included numerous different graphical styles and, perhaps most importantly, a wide gulf between its good graphics, those included in its polished FMVs, and its gameplay graphics, the chunky bucket character models who you actually spent 99% of the game staring at. Thanks to our collective imaginations and this graphical gap, many FF7 likers immediately started to imagine the game is looking better than it ever actually looked in real life. This, I think, led to a surprising phenomenon. Almost immediately after the game released, and certainly by the release of Final Fantasy X for the PlayStation 2 just a few short years later, we were practically begging Squaresoft to make Final Fantasy VII again. The field of historical preservation is intimately connected with the concept of memory, both the individual and collective varieties. Research in psychology shows that memory is not a straightforward recording of events. It isn't a simple series of video recordings, snatched from reality by our senses and deposited on the spinning disk of our brain hard drives. Our memories are a complex mixture of emotions and sensory echoes, recreated over and over by our minds when we call upon them, or when they're called upon unbidden in our dreams. Most importantly, our memories are not syncretic. They are created anew each time that we need them. Like history, memories are fluid narratives that inherently mix facts with our past and present feelings. Heritage, by extension, is a collection of our societal memories, the cultural hippocampus, if you will. Historical preservation is the study of how we collect our memories and make them concrete, be it with the telling of historical stories or the protection of the physical objects and places we think best encapsulates a memory. When we preserve a place, we must make a dynamic space into a syncretic myth one that will obfuscate at least some portion of the whole tale. When I was a kid, I spent almost every day of my summer at camp. My family were big into the Boy Scouts. My brothers and I are all Eagle Scouts. My parents also both worked in public schools and so, quote, had their summers off, end quote. But of course, everyone who works in a public school knows that nobody really has their summers off. Instead, you spend your summers prepping for the following year, working part-time seasonal jobs for extra cash, or in the case of my parents, both. My mom worked as the camp nurse for a Boy Scout camp, and my dad taught ecology and nature merit badges. Neither paid well, but the money was needed and it came with free housing. This meant that I spent every moment of the summer months wandering the staggeringly beautiful deep woods of rural Connecticut. 
I have many fond, precious memories of those long days. Many spent largely alone. I explored the forest, usually with a really decent stick by my side to act as my imagined sword. We didn't have a television at camp, and so I was separated at these times from my beloved video games. Interestingly, I don't remember ever regretting this, though I do recall the memory of video games looming large in their physical absence. The storylines I spun for myself in those old woods were certainly inspired by the games sitting at home. JRPGs were particularly good storytellers for a boy of 9 or 10, and I remember acting out memorable scenes from Crusader of Senti, Final Fantasy Zelda, Fantasy Star, Shining in the Darkness, and Super Mario RPG. In the crystallizing effect of my memory, these days have become iconic, transfixed in their unerring significance. They are capital I important. They are a time of innocence. It's fitting then that camp was, when I let my memory wander into the more painful territories, where I remember losing that innocence. Let's talk examples of historic preservation. I'm going to start by paraphrasing from some of my own research on this topic. I'll put the citation and link in the description, along with some other links to research on the topic of historical preservation. The field of historic preservation is an outcome of the rising importance of heritage to the sustaining of modern, national, local, and individual identity. Max Page and Randall Mason point out that, quote, the potential of historic preservation as a social movement is immense. It has the capacity to help forestall the destructive and unregulated development that threatens to destroy the places Americans love, end quote. David Lowenthal, in contrast, portrays the pitfalls of historic preservation in the invocation of heritage, arguing that, quote, it is the chief focus of patriotism and a prime lure of tourism. Heritage undermines historical truth with twisted myth. And further, heritage passions play a major role in national and ethnic conflict, in racism and resurgent genetic determinism, in museum and commemorative policy, in global theft, illicit trade, and rising demands for repatriating art and antiquities. The movement has saved the sites of many of the nation's most important historic places and aids in the remembrance not just of patriotic, good elements of the American story, but also those places that evince national shame and essential reflection. These include historic houses, battlefields, prisons, internment camps, natural landscapes, immigrant neighborhoods, and on and on. The early preservation movement occurred within a broader cultural context of rapid and unsettling change. In the northeast of the United States, the historic preservation movement's origins are usually attributed to early civic actions to save historic buildings and urban centers, particularly those associated with founders of one sort or another. For instance, in Boston, the saving and restoring of the Old South Meeting House in the 1870s, the restoration of the Bullfinch State House in the 1890s, and the unsuccessful effort to preserve John Hancock's house in the 1860s were all early examples of organized historic preservation efforts. Of course, these preservation movements did not occur in a historical vacuum. The year that I turned 11 held the summer when I started to feel differently about my body. It was at camp. That summer, I was diagnosed with osgood schlatter disease, a quite common inflammatory condition that affects the knees. I remember my doctor referring to it as growing pains, but it's different from normal growing pains. It doesn't go away, and it made it very difficult and painful to run, jump, or do any sort of serious physical activity. I suddenly went from a kid who could steal second base before the pitch reached the catcher to a kid who could barely make it out of the batter's box. The inactivity that came with the knee pain, mixed with a diet of steady carbohydrates at camp, led to what I now know was a pretty severe weight gain for a kid of my age. By the end of the summer, I was starting to notice that my stomach was no longer flat, that my hips were widening, that my body was changing. It's easy for me now as a grown man to recognize that this is pretty typical stuff, normal puberty-driven changes mixed with the specific challenges of a temporary health condition. I'm not a naturally thin guy, I never have been since those months in 1997, and that's okay. Let me tell you though, being the fat kid in the late 90s in America was not okay. It was not in the least bit okay. The turn of the 20th century was a period of tumultuous change around the globe. In the United States, the decades from the end of the Civil War to the start of the First World War were defined by social and economic upheaval. Economic and technological change was increasing at a seemingly exponential rate. Racial and religious shifts were underway across the nation, and the movements of people and ideas was supercharged by emerging systems of travel and trade. Indeed, both international immigration from Europe and the internal migration of Southern Black Americans known as the Great Migration flooded Northern states with new residents. Many of these were met with resistance and hostility. 
People have been debating the issue of immigration since the earliest European settlers landed in North America. These discussions have often revolved around economic, cultural, and religious anxieties, with each generation fearing that the newest immigrants would be unable to assimilate into the existing culture and would irreparably damage the economy and character of American cities. The earliest Italian immigrants to the Northeast began as seasonal laborers, but later sought to settle permanently. Their faith, language, and culture were seen as suspect by many older American families. Here we see some of the earliest examples of the connection between historic preservation efforts and blue blood sentiment towards the changing demographics of the country. One example is Boston's Paul Revere House, built in circa 1685. The antiquarian Samuel Adams Drake wrote of the Revere House and its proximity to Italian immigrant communities in the North End. Pah! The atmosphere is actually thick with the vile odors of garlic and onions, of macaroni and lazzaroni. The dirty tenements swarm with greasy, voluble Italians. One can scarce hear the sound of his own English mother tongue from one end of the square to the other. And finally, can we believe it with our own eyes, here is good Father Taylor's old brick Bethel turned into a Catholic chapel. Shade of Cotton Mather, has it come to this, that a mass house should stand with the very pale of the thrice consecrated old Puritan sanctuary? So, we must note that historic preservation in addition to being an academic, practical, and personally emotional movement, is also often a political act. Eighteen years after the Japanese and American releases of Final Fantasy VII, Square Enix did something incredible. They announced that they were going to remake Final Fantasy VII. I remember watching the announcement, not live, but sometime later on on YouTube, that image of Cloud walking through Midgar, those graphics, that music. God damn, they finally did it, and that beautiful moment of joy lasted but a moment before the disappointing news began to flow. The game would be released, well, when? Who knew? It would turn out to be five years, five stressful years. Also, the game would be episodic. What did that even mean? I had no idea. My mind was flooded with images of mobile games, of Call of Duty's, FIFA's, Madden's, and of Half-Life Episode 2, leaving us to wait on an eternal cliffhanger. I did not like that this game would be episodic. The first episode would be just Midgar. Okay, I wasn't one of those fools yelling that Midgar was little more than a prologue, an hour or two at most. I remembered, in fact, that Midgar had taken me just over 10 hours to complete at the tender age of 11. Nonetheless, about the Final Fantasy VII Remake, I worried until, of course, I played it. Holy Christ, y'all. Square Enix made this game and they somehow didn't completely blow it. I'm gonna be honest. I really thought they were gonna blow it. Final Fantasy 13, Those horrible mobile versions of FF5 and 6? Final Fantasy 15? I will continue being honest with you. I had thought Final Fantasy was dead. Yet, here was a remake of Final Fantasy 7, somehow texturally recapturing the essence of the original game while simultaneously feeling completely modern. A game so full of love, campy humor, frankly bizarre side characters, and an action-packed combat system. A game that smartly kept a meticulous hyper-focus on the core cast and their relationships. Tifa and Cloud's uncomfortable childhood friendship shielding the possibility of romance. The vivaciousness of Aerith as she appears to complete the greatest love triangle in video game history. And the undervalued blossoming friendship of Cloud and Barrett. Even Tifa and Aerith's relationship is revitalized here. Their instantaneous friendship and mutual trust feel so believable, so joyful. I love it. This is the essence of a successful project of preservation. To make something ancient with something new that evokes the nostalgia of our collective memory. It's more than nostalgia, of course. Good preservation can touch our hearts. It's Christmas morning, 1997. My dad and I have stumbled in from the cold after a trip to a local radio shack owned by a Jewish family. Turns out we did not have a modern enough television to use with the PlayStation, and we needed an adapter to make it work with our ancient CRT. He's not grumpy about the trip, though. He just seems pleased to get the thing working. Beautifully, blissfully, I sink into Final Fantasy VII. The opening menu emerges. The Final Fantasy theme rises and crescendos. Listen, I know video games are... Well, I don't know. They're not literature. Final Fantasy VII is not Hemingway or Dickens. It's not cinema, and it never will be. I don't care. Eleven-year-old me was there, 1,000% there, enthralled, blown away, moved, fulfilled. For a while, I forgot the curves and flats of my body. 
and I forgot the words of my bullies, and all was good. Why would we preserve a game, though? Of all the things, why something as ephemeral and experiential as a video game? Okay, so I've already pointed out that we preserve things all the time. We preserve historic houses and archaeological sites, places of celebrations and places of shame. We might argue over the specifics of this practice, like which sorts of things should be preserved and when we preserve them, how we should go about doing so, and when should we not preserve something because it's more important that it be destroyed. But we probably all agree that there are at least some cases when it's good to attempt to hold history constant, even though this is about as easy to do as grasping the wind and preserving it in a bottle. But why a game? And if a game, are there examples of this already happening? More on that in a moment. Video games are a form of art, right? I mean, God, I hope we've stopped arguing about that by now. It's been decades, dudes. Some of it's bad art. Some of it is straight schlock, crapola, absolute garbage, but it's still art. And on the flip side, some of it is exceptionally good art. Games can drive our emotions and force us to contemplate themes of real importance. And I'd argue they do this just as well as films or books or anything else for that matter. All right, maybe that's good enough. Games are art and art is worth preserving. Well, except when it's not. Should we preserve all games? What about bad games? Generally speaking, we do not preserve all historical things. In the traditional field of historical preservation, we obviously don't preserve all houses or all battlefields, and unfortunately, we sure don't preserve all of the beautiful natural habitats and their ecosystems. Though, okay, maybe that's because of practical considerations that don't apply to games. Those things take up space in the real world, sometimes a lot of space. They have to compete with other things that take up space, like housing for people to actually live in, for instance. It's also extremely expensive to preserve, say, a historic building. Sometimes they require special laws or exemptions from laws because they don't meet modern standards of safety or zoning. There's a creative technique in historical preservation that I like called adaptive reuse. That's when you preserve a building or a landscape by giving it a new purpose. When you convert an old factory into apartment buildings or a Civil War battlefield into a park, that sort of thing. Can we apply that concept to games and other digital preservation projects? Someone's probably thinking about that somewhere. So maybe I've convinced you we should preserve games. Their art, their politics, their culture. They also don't take up space in the real world and they aren't exorbitantly expensive to preserve. Well, usually they aren't anyway. So why not preserve them? All they really need is someone who cares enough to try. Someone, for instance, like Frank Cifaldi and Kelsey Lewin in their Video Game History Project. The Video Game History Project is a nonprofit, quote, dedicated to preserving, celebrating, and teaching the history of video games. Quick reminder, you can find links and citations in the description of this video. Also consider subscribing to updates on this channel for future videos on topics like this one. The VGHP does a lot of things, including cataloging and preserving books and magazines from throughout the medium's history, preserving both the hardware and software elements of games both old and new, and running educational programs for many audiences. The VGHP does good, important work, and they do it impressively well in an industry that has no existing framework aimed towards preservational goals. In an industry driven so heavily by capitalistic profit motives, where the cost of entry for the production of games has traditionally been very high, and relying on fast-evolving technology where every five years there's new hardware, new software, and the incentive to try and sell those new products, there is little appetite for saving or preserving game code or hardware for the pure purposes of preservation. Cifaldi and Lewin's project and others like it are trying to step in and accomplish this from the outside. This work has non-game models to mimic, of course, including the very preservation systems I'm discussing throughout this essay that are right now working to save historic places as well as archaeological collections. The VGHP is part archive, part museum, part activism, and part education, which is very much like what many house museums and archaeological preserves have been doing for decades. Supporting and encouraging work like that done by the VGHP and similar organizations is a vital part of games preservation. I'm a freshman in college, just as the cart reaches its highest peak. As the cart begins its most gut-clenching tumble, a cacophony of track and wheel, wind and squealing, I'm curled in a ball on my dorm room bed. I have done something from which I cannot return. I have started a chain reaction from which I'll never escape. The cart hits the bottom of the curve and hard. The model laid out by the VGHP is not the only way to preserve video games. I want to make the argument to you that remakes and remasters are also a form of video game preservation, and further, that this also mimics existing preservational frameworks. 
I actually think that the Final Fantasy VII Remake and other ground-up reimaginings like the Resident Evil 1 through 3 remakes and the rumored remake of Silent Hill 2 are much more like the kind of preservation being carried out at historic homes like the Revere House. Certainly, we do not need to work hard to physically preserve a video game that printed millions of copies and still runs on many modern systems. FF7 can be emulated with relative ease and it can be purchased digitally on modern consoles. So then, what's the point of the remake? Well, the Final Fantasy VII remake preserves Final Fantasy VII in the same way that Main Street USA and Disney World preserves 1915 Small Town America. I don't mean that as a pejorative, even. It's literally what it does. It is a clean crystallization of what our collective imagination thinks Final Fantasy VII was in 1997. Main Street USA is based on Walt Disney's memories of his childhood, perfect in every way, except for all the things that aren't represented. The racism, sexism, segregation, poverty, and on and on of early 20th century America do not make an appearance in Disney World. I don't mean to say that the things swept under the rug of Final Fantasy VII Remake are akin to anything so dark as these, but things have been swept under the rug here, and we're being asked to misremember them. Main Street USA is a form of preservation, Maybe not a good one, maybe one specifically aimed towards explicit capitalist goals involving whitewashing on the grandest scale, but preservation nonetheless. No form of preservation is perfect, because as I've discussed already, they always involve some decontextualization. Until we invent a time machine, and even perhaps after we do, we will always need to highlight certain aspects of history and hide others in order to present a narrative of what we think the past was and was not. An act of preservation can also create a moment of reflection. Take this exhibit at the Museum of Natural History for an example. Much like Main Street USA, it was created decades ago to tell a clean version of a partially imagined past. I love this as an example though because of the way it's been reinterpreted. The exhibit was updated in recent years and instead of rewriting the narrative in the diorama itself, they added this text that invites the viewer to interpret the exhibit within its own context. What narrative was the diorama meant to tell and what aspects of that narrative does it consciously ignore? Why didn't they simply get rid of this exhibit and start from scratch, aiming instead to show something more historically accurate? Well, the museum has done that in other places. An example is in the Hall of Human Origins, which the museum has completely reimagined because for many years it was practically an ode to scientific racism. Here instead the curators invite us to reflect on the process of memory and memorialization and the role that historical preservation plays in it. The coaster is approaching its final drop. The climax is here. The cart is cresting. The cart is falling. I am wandering the halls of a college dormitory. I am telling my parents in their living room. I am surviving thanks to the love of a person most precious. I am growing and moving and changing every day. And the years, they are the tracks beneath my feet clacking away. The cart falls and falls and falls. I am losing the ones that I love and letting the years slip through my fingers like sand or water. So much has happened since that Christmas morning. I found and lost in equal measure. I've smiled till it hurt and cried until I thought I'd empty myself and turn to smoke, a ghost devoid of self. I want the ride to stop now. I want to go back. I want to be seven or nine or 11 years old again and to not think about the curves and flats of my body. I want to be 32 and have him back. I want to get off this ride. Just like at Disney World, the Revere House, or the Museum of Natural History, the makers of Final Fantasy VII Remake simultaneously embellished aspects of the game, relying upon our, the player that is, false memories to do so. And at other times, they hid or changed aspects of the original, again playing a sort of magic trick, letting our nostalgic dreams of what we thought we experienced in 1997 do some of the work for them. I don't mean to say they were being lazy. Quite the opposite. This magic trick required tremendous work, trust, and maybe even a bit of luck. They bet big that they could add a whole bunch of stuff to this game, and that that stuff would harmonize enough with what we thought we were experiencing as children or young adults, and that that harmony would lead to forgiveness. Personally, I think they nailed it. The makers meticulously preserved the game's sense of humor, its bizarre weirdness, its pacing, and its action. I want to linger on those first points for a moment. The original Final Fantasy VII was goofy as heck. The whole series has a wonderful sense of humor. Even Final Fantasy XV has a sense of humor. It would have been so easy to drain this game of its bizarre jokes and uncomfortable humor, or to misinterpret that bizarreness as well, misinterpretations. 
Instead, the new writers wrote the game to be funny in ways that were texturally, spiritually similar without trying to perfectly recreate the jokes of the original. They even somehow managed to incorporate the distinct humor of both the original Japanese and English translations. Final Fantasy VII Remake is campy and bloated and goofy as hell, and I love it. Of course, they also changed so many things, so, so many things. Like the addition of the text to the Natural History Museum exhibit or the removal of 20th century additions to a historic home, the remake strips away the clunkiness of Final Fantasy VII and replaces it with the smoothness only our childlike glee could have imagined in 1997 or 98. By adding modern amenities like voice acting, AAA graphics, a sort of open world, and fully orchestrated music, the makers of the remake captured the essence of our youthly wonder, bottled it, and sold it to us for $69.99. It's worth the price of admission, in my opinion. The ride is coasting to a stop now. There are no more rises and no more falls. The thrills are done for now. Though if we could, let's imagine get back into line and ride again. Would we feel the same again? Can we ever recapture that which is lost to the movement of time? And if not, can we replace it with convincing enough simulation, stripping away the excess of our memory to leave only the barest, most important aspects? Maybe we can even heighten those parts that most resonate in our memory. But in doing so, do we lose something essential? Perhaps preservation is about more than just holding on to the memories and the objects of our shared past. Perhaps it is an act of preserving our own past selves, the cells that our memory serves to sketch for each of us in our darkest moments. By the time that I left home for college for the first time, I had started to turn inward, to look into myself with a sort of hatred, not unlike that espoused by Samuel Adams Drake toward those voluble Italians. This new self was unwelcome here, and I wanted to turn back the clock. I wanted to return to my child self, content to wander the forests of Connecticut, or to sit atop a woven rug over a cold poured concrete floor in 1997. But what was I really on that Christmas morning? Was I happy? Was I thin? Was I carefree? Was I thoughtless in the movement and curvature of my body? Or have I simply forgotten the complexities of my own younger mind? Historic preservation can be an act of nearly pure goodness, like the work of Cifaldi and Lewin. It can also be an act of selective forgetting, like the preservation of Founders architecture in Boston, a displacement of the present in lieu of an imagined past. I have spent exactly half my life trying to erase my current self and replace him with some past version that may have never existed at all. Why have I done this? How do I stop? I am aware of how destructive it is, yet I persist in this project of constant destruction and rebuilding. The Final Fantasy VII Remake is a beautiful work of art, a magical recapturing of what we thought this game was a quarter century ago, a game that we played during a time that we thought we were something better than we are now. But like this lovely, thoughtful piece of art, we are also good, as we are right now. We are better than good enough. We are beautiful. I am beautiful. <laughs>